So we are going to be looking over the next seven weeks, eight weeks, a new sermon series. And it's all about rethinking, rethinking what the church is, rethinking what prayer is, rethinking what worship is. And I think it's relevant for where we are as a church, but also individually. I think everyone's been challenged by what has been going on over the last month and a half. I know I have certainly been challenged. And I want to ask, what is God asking of his church at Holy Lodge? But also, what is God asking of me, me personally? What is he actually asking of me to do? If I claim to be a disciple of him, what is he asking of me? But what is he asking of his church here? Not what makes me happy, but what does God really want? So I'm going to assume that all of us are here by choice. No one's been been forced into coming here. Some of you may think, well, but I'm assuming we've all come here by choice. You've gotten dressed, you've traveled down here, or on a Zoom, if you're at home on, on phone listening in, but you've chosen to do this. My question is, why? Do none of you have anything better to do on a Sunday morning? I do. I've got lots of things I could do on a Sunday morning. What do, you hope to achieve, uh, what do you hope to achieve by being here? I want you guys to think about that. What's going to be different for you guys at 12 o'clock that wouldn't be different had you stayed at home or not come to church or not Zoomed in? What's going to be different for you? And I think it's important we ask these questions. Because if you're hungry and you go to the pub, what do you hope to achieve? To have a meal and to be full. If you go to the cinema... What do you hope to achieve? To have seen a good film and hopefully not wasted your money. Maybe have a bit of popcorn. But what about church? What do you hope to achieve by coming here? Are you hoping just to sing a few songs, have some tea and coffee, chat with some of your mates? Do you want something deeper? Do you want to be healed of whatever ailment you have? Do you want to be refreshed? Do you want to be encouraged? Do you want to feel the Spirit's presence guiding you, giving you wisdom? What do you want from coming to church this morning? I think there's going to be three things, three categories that some of us are in. And hopefully if, if, you, if you're not here and you're listening in from wherever you're at, you can kind of get this. But three categories. You come to church... You might sing, you you might not, but you just don't really get it. You're happy to attend. You like some of the people here. And maybe there's just something about coming here that that you you just enjoy. You've heard the sermons. You've maybe asked questions. But you just don't want it to go any further. You are content with your lifestyle. You are content with where you are at. Maybe you come to church and you you contribute financially, you participate, you pray, you might even be a member of the church, but you need some parameters. You see, you can't just do everything the church is asking. You're happy to contribute, as long as it's on your terms. You say God's will be done, but as long as it's still within what you like long as it's within your plans. The church stuff is well and good, and and you believe in God, but I'm not going to change my whole lifestyle for it. I like what I'm doing. You know, if God really loves me, certainly he should allow me to continue on living the lifestyle I have. It's not hurting anyone. And we sort of ignore what Jesus tells us in Luke 14. Anyone who comes to me but refuses to let go of father, mother, spouse, children, brothers, sisters, even their own selves, they can't be my disciple. Anyone who won't shoulder his own cross and follow behind me cannot be my disciple. Those are strong words. We come here, we believe, we participate, we encourage people, but we kind of lead two separate lives, church life and the outside church life. Or maybe you're prepared to surrender your whole life. You commit whatever it takes. You know it's going to be hard. And you know you won't always get it right. But you want to do it. You genuinely want to commit your whole life to Christ. Your motto is that of Philippians 2. 
Think of yourselves the way Christ Jesus thought of himself. When the time came, he set aside the privileges of deity and took on the status of a slave, becoming human. And becoming human, he stayed. It was an incredibly humbling process. He did not claim special privileges. Instead, he lived a selfless, obedient life and then died a selfless, obedient death. You honestly say God's will be done. So where do you sit? You see, for each category, there is a cost. Every Sunday morning, you wake up and you choose, are you going to come to church? Are you going to flick on Zoom? Are you going to phone in for those who who can't actually make it? And you choose what you're going to do as soon as you walk through those doors. Are you going to be an encourager or a grumbler? Are you going to speak to someone new or stick with the people you know? Will you sing with your heart or fold your arms and just mumble the words? Are you coming to give of yourself or coming with an expectation of being entertained? Are you not entertained? As Gladiator had said. And coming here to church is no different. Whether we choose to accept it or not, throughout our lives, in every day, in every situation, we are choosing to live a certain way. And the scripture tells us, Joshua 24, choose this day whom you will serve. Who have you chosen today to serve? Now, a whole day, that's pretty daunting. And I have to be honest with you guys. Choose the whole day whom I will serve. I don't know what the day is going to bring. There may be frustration. There may be people parking in my car park or cut me up, or I may have unexpected bills. I don't know if I can choose this day to serve God. So I might need to just simplify a little bit. I'm just going to choose those 60 minutes that I'm here. I'm going to choose who I'm going to serve when I come in. Because it is a sacrifice. But Jesus tells us, take up your cross daily and follow me. But the cross is heavy. It's hard. It's brutal. It's painful. It's cumbersome. It's inconvenient. And frankly, sometimes this cross is too much to bear. And we need to ask ourselves in the church. Because if you genuinely want to know God, and you genuinely want him to speak to you, and you genuinely want him to change you, and you genuinely want him to move you, you have to make a choice. And I want us to look at three quick things. I'm sorry this is hard hitting, but I felt we're we're coming on to a new series. The church is moving forward. Things are happening, and God is on the move. And we've got to be honest with ourselves. We really need to be honest with ourselves where we're going. Firstly, do you seek God? Now, that might seem a silly statement coming here in church, but as I said before, and and I've stolen this um, from someone, and I keep using it because I think it's great, coming to church does not make you a Christian any more than going to Pizza Hut makes you, uh, going to Pizza Hut makes you a pizza. Okay? Coming to church does not make you a Christian. Some of you know God. Some of you don't know God. Some of you have forgotten about God. Secondly, do you actually listen out for God? See, God is always speaking but we tend not to hear because we have so many things going on in our minds. And thirdly, will you act on what God wants of you? Missio Dei, mission of God, that's to save the world. And he's asking us to help with that. So let's start with the basics. Do you honestly seek God? Do you honestly seek God? I'm not asking about do you read the Bible. I'm not asking if you pray. I mean, do you on your knees, head bowed, heart open, God, I want to know you. I want to know you. If you are real, if you're all those things that the Bible says, things I've heard about, I want to know you. And I know some of you are saying, well, I come to church, isn't that enough? I contribute, I do these things, isn't that enough? I get it that for some of you, coming to church has been a huge step. You have so many other things to do on a Sunday. And this isn't a reprimand. The world is changing. The world does not abide by the time schedule of the church. We've got to recognize that. We tell our kids, 
you can't go to sports on a Sunday, because that's when they do their sports stuff, is on a Sunday, because we've got church. What a great way of alienating our children. Saturday is now the time when people go out to the pubs and go out and do things. So Sunday morning tends to be a time of relaxation. We're busy Monday to Friday. The weekend is so important. Saturday is a day that you kind of do the odd jobs, and that leaves a Sunday. You got to get up and come to church. It's a huge commitment, and I get it. And some of you, it's not just the commitment. For some of you, church is boring. Why are you laughing? For some of you, church is boring. It's so different than what you're used to. We talk about the love of God and the peace of God, and we talk about all these things, and it's like, you have no idea what happens out, out there. I am out there, Monday to Saturday, busting my bottom, trying to do things, dealing with people, and the church is just lovey-dovey and happy and Lori and all this stuff. You have no idea. What happens out there is so different than what happens in here. And for some of you, Coming to church is just like being on another planet. It's just completely, completely different. And if, if you are here, and if that is you, thank you for coming. I don't know if anyone's ever, ever said that to you. Thank you for coming to church. Thank you for being committed. Thank you for taking the time to actually come here. Thank you for, if you're at home on Zoom, thank you for taking the time, for getting the computer out and, and doing all the things you've got to do. Or on the phone. Thank you for doing that. Irrespective of how long you've been coming or the history, thank you. Coming here at 1045 is a huge step. But my question is, now what? What is next? Because there's nothing special about this building. It is not a holy building. I think some of you need to hear that. There is nothing special about this building. The purpose of this building is to keep the rain off our heads. Let's keep the weather out. Uh, yeah, we can say it, it helps us to come together and, and all this stuff. But there's nothing special about it. You coming here doesn't make you a Christian because it's called church. Are you seeking God? You've woken up. You've got dressed. You've left your house. You're listening to music that, frankly, you probably would never listen to outside of church. You speak to people that Frankly, you probably would never speak to outside of church because some of them are weird or, or maybe you're the weird one and they're not. You can, you can choose. And you listen to someone speak for 20 minutes, hopefully not longer, but I think it might be on, so I'm sorry, about how you should live your life. If you don't know God and you're doing that, that's a bit of insanity to me. Why would you put yourself through that? But if God is real and you want to spend time with them, you want to, to know him, and you don't take that in. It's a bit like going to somebody's house, and you're, you're there, and you're, you're having your, your tea and coffee, or your drink, and you're chatting with people, and you're enjoying yourself. And you come here, and you're enjoying yourself, but you never go into the dining room where there's a smorgasbord of food just waiting to be eaten. You never go into the back garden where there's a lovely crystal pool waiting to be swam in. You're missing out on so much because you don't know God. And if you are a Christian, and by that I mean you've, you've, you've actually said, God, come into my heart. Are you seeking God's presence daily? Are you here expecting God to move? One thing Co has taught us is that people don't expect God to move where they're at. How can God move on a computer screen? It's not possible. How can he move in our house? We're not at church. God can't move. How can we move if we don't have good worship music or a riveting speaker or, you know, entertainment? God is here right now in this place. How many here believe that? He is here. And if you're at home and you know God, he is there at that place. He is moving in people's lives. And I want, I want everyone to hear this right now, because this, this was relevant to me. If God is not moving in your life, 
if you don't feel God's presence right now, that's not his fault. I'm going to say that again. If God is not moving in your life right now and you don't feel his presence, that's not his fault. You can't say, I don't feel God's presence because of the music. I don't feel presence because children were noisy. I don't feel God's presence because the, the building's the wrong color or the lights or it's too hot or this. If you're generally seeking God out in every situation, in every location, at any moment, trust me, he will be with you. You are desperately, genuinely, desiringly wanting him to move in your life. He will. But if you have things stopping it, if you've put obstacles in his place, that's not his fault. Did you come this morning honestly expecting to meet God? I'm not going to ask you to raise your hands or anything, but did, did you honestly come this morning thinking, I'm going to meet God this morning. I'm going to feel his presence. If you didn't, why not? Secondly, are you listening for God's voice? So we need to get foundations. We need to know what God wants for us as a church and what God wants for us individually. We ask that. We say, God, we want to know your will. We want to do your will. So let's get three foundational truths. First one, we're called to use our gifts and love one another. That's what God tells us. First Peter 4. Above all, maintain constant love for one another, for love co covers a multitude of sins. Be hospitable to one another without complaining. Like good stewards of the manifold grace of God, serve one another with whatever gift each of you has received. Not some of you, but what each of you have been given. You each have a gift from God. Let's use it. Secondly, we are called to tell the world about Jesus. Matthew 28. Go, therefore, and preach the gospel, making disciples of all men. You can't get away from that. I'm sorry. None of us have an excuse for not doing it. It's not just the minister. It is everyone. We are all responsible for telling people about Jesus. Have you told anyone today or yesterday? Have you prayed with anyone yesterday? Have you invited anyone to church today? I'm not going to let that one go because my question is, and, I'm, and this, is, this is participation here. Why do we not invite our friends, our family, our colleagues to church. Blurt it out, anyone. They wouldn't understand it. Wouldn't understand it? Anyone else? <laughs> yep. Anyone else? Come on. Frightened they might say yes. That's a <laughs> that's a fantastic. That is a, that was actually, I've written a book, I've written, I've read a book and it was talking about that. So sometimes we're afraid that someone might actually say yes and we're going, oh, bummer. I didn't really want them to come along. But we're afraid sometimes. We're unsure. We don't know. But how do we change that? As his disciples, as members of this church and non-members of the church, how do we change the environment so we feel confident to invite our colleagues and friends and family into the church building? Thirdly, because we need to be training one another and discipling one another. So, so we know what God is asking of us. Okay, We can't get away with that. We know what God is asking of us. But are we still listening to things? How do we know what the Spirit is saying? Are we prepared to hear? Firstly, are we physically ready to receive? Are you prepared to listen physically? I have to confess that there are times when people are praying and I've fallen asleep. I'm not going to say who, and it's not, it's not a particular person, but there are times when I fall asleep because I'm just tired. I'm physically tired. You have those, those kind of retreats or something like that where they say, oh, go, go away for, you know, 10 minutes and just, just dwell on the richness of God. And after about one minute, I'm, I'm dwelling on la-la land. If you are physically tired, you're not going to be ready to hear from God. Go to sleep. I give you guys permission. If you are tired physically, go to sleep. And are you distracted with things? Are you distracted with things? 
Are you saying, God, I want to hear your voice, and you're going, I need to be out. I've got a roast on. You're not going to hear God if you're distracted. Are you prepared and ready to listen and hear what God has to say for you? And thirdly, are you willing to act out what God is asking of you? For it is by grace we have been saved. This is so true. Nothing we can do can save us. God in his unbelievable mercy has forgiven us of our sins. The problem, though, is that we can easily treat this costly grace as cheap grace. I've got to do a bit of reading, so I apologize for looking down. But I, I read this um, a few nights ago. So if you don't know who Diedrich Bonhoeffer is, I'm sure I'm, I'm saying that wrong. But he's, he's a German theologian in 1600s, maybe? I don't, I don't know. I could be wrong. Maybe a bit, bit earlier than that. Um, he, he says this. Today, grace is represented as a church's inexhaustible treasury from which she gives blessings with generous hands without questions of fix or fixing limits. Grace without price, grace without cost. We're just about ready to do communion. Christians live out their lives like the rest of the world. Cheap grace is preaching of forgiveness without the requiring repentance. Baptism without church discipline. Absolution without personal confession. Cheap grace is grace without discipleship. Grace without the cost, uh, cross. Grace without Jesus Christ. But costly grace is the treasure hidden in the field. For the sake of it, a man will gladly go and sell all he has to attain it. It is that pearl which the merchants sell all he has to kind of get it. It is the kingly rule of Christ, for whose sake a man will willingly pluck out his eye, which causes him to stumble. stumble. It is the call of Jesus Christ at which the disciple leaves his nets and follows him. Costly grace is the gospel which must be sought again and again, the gift which must be asked for, the door at which a man must knock. Such grace is costly because it calls us to follow. It is grace because it calls us to follow Jesus Christ. It is costly because it condemns sin and grace because it justifies the sinner. Above all, it is costly because it costs God the life of his son. There are those in the church who want cheap grace. You have your fire insurance and you claim Jesus is Lord, but then complain when things aren't going your way. You want the church to make you feel comfortable. You want the music to be a certain way. You want the service to be a certain way. You want prayer to be done a certain way. You want communion to be done a certain way. And you moan and complain when it is not your liking. You have forgotten you have been bought with a price. The early Baptists were being murdered to become a member of the church. The, 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 English, um, sorry, the Church of England and the leaders of the time sought out and murdered those who claimed to be Baptists and a Baptist at the time. And to become a member of the church, you were risking your life. Want to be a member of this church? You were risking your life. They were hunted and killed, and yet the church still grew. How powerful it is to know that. That even though they were risking their lives, the church still grew. They had hope and encouragement, and this was the price they paid. You see, God is not asking you to go to another country. He's not asking you to quit your job. He's not asking you to give up all your money or your time. He's simply asking you to be obedient. He's asking you to consider the cost that he willingly purchased for us. Are you going to act when he calls you to act? Seek, listen, and act. We're nearly done. Jeremiah 29 says this, and we, we, um, Ali mentioned this. You will find me when you seek me with all your heart. Matthew 7, ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and the door will be opened. For everyone, everyone who asks, receives. The one who seeks, finds. The one who knocks, the door will be opened. Seek God. Seek God. I'm asking that of you guys. When you come in here, seek God's presence. Proverbs 4.25, let your eyes look directly forward as your gaze be straight before you. Don't become distracted. 1 Peter 5.8, be sober-minded, be watchful, attentive, listening. Proverbs 5.1, be attentive to my wisdom, incline your ear to my understanding. Matthew 6, but when you pray, go into your room and shut the door and pray to your Father who's in secret. Psalm 46, be Still, be still 
and know I am God. Put aside those distractions and listen for God's voice because he will speak to you. That is a promise. He will speak to you. Matthew 7, 21, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but the one who does the will of my Father. Matthew 6, 10, Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. 1 Peter 2, 15, For this is the will of God, that by doing good, you should put to silence the ignorance of foolish people. Romans 12, 2, Do not be conformed by the pattern of this world, but be transformed by testing you may, that's doing, you may discern what is the will of God. James 1.22, be doers of the world, word and not just hearers. See, Christianity is not a spectator sport. Being a disciple of Christ is to act. Are you seeking God today? Are you listening and are you willing to act? Is it costly? Yes. It is very costly. Is it worth it? I said before, I've got better things to do on a Sunday. I don't because I want to be with God. Every step of my journey, I want to be with God. Because I have seen that world out there, I have lived that world out there, and I can honestly say, I enjoy more being in fellowship with God than in fellowship with the world. Are you genuinely seeking God? Are you genuinely listening out for His voice, and are you genuinely willing to do what he asks because it may be he's asking you to put down your nets and follow him on a journey and that journey may have ups and downs but it's with him and it will be worth it i can promise you that it will be worth it let me pray heavenly father we just come before you and we live in this world full of heartache and sorrow and doubt and confusion, and worry, and pain, and suffering. We live in this world, but you ask us to not be a part of it. But we cannot do that in our strength, and so I ask that you would give us that strength to carry on each and every day in service to you, to move forward each and every day, seeking you out. Speak to us, Lord, and help us to be your disciples. We ask that in your name. Amen. Amen.